Right, hello everyone, how you doing? Welcome along, we're looking today at Poppies by Jean Weir. I don't need to tell you too much about the connotations of the title itself, obviously heavily uh, to do with Remembrance Sunday and uh, those um, ceremonies that go on in around November time. Uh, Jean Weir herself uh, was commissioned to write this poem by Caroline Duffy, who was the poet laureate in 2009. So it was against the context of the Iran and Afghanistan conflicts that were going on at the time. Uh, those were fresh in our head. Uh, Jean Weir has got an interesting background. She has got uh, Italian uh, origins and she spent some of the time growing up in Manchester as well. She moved to Northern Ireland in the 1980s so she would have um, had first hand experience there with the Civil War or the Troubles as it's or colloquially known um, which could be relevant for you. Uh, on top of that then she has a background in textiles uh, she's interested in dressmaking and she talks about um, borrowing so she uses the kind of language that you might associate with a, a dress designer here or somebody who knits or sews those kinds of verbs appear quite frequently in this poem uh, and all of this kind of jargon we call it kind of out to jargon or words that we associate with a specific uh, expertise area. So the expertise of textiles here are the, is the jargon that she uses. Uh, she was commissioned to write the poem in 2019 against the background of the Iran and Afghanistan conflicts that were going on at the time. But uh, she has said that she was thinking of Wilfred Owen when she wrote this poem, and particularly about his mum. So it is written from the perspective uh, of a mother who is uh, visiting a graveyard actually at one point, and at another point is sending um, their son off to school. Jean Weir has two sons. At the time of writing of this poem, uh, they were teenagers. Uh, although neither of them have been aware to uh, frontline contract conflict as a soldier, so it is although it is from the perspective of mother, it is not from Jane Weir's perspective. So please do talk about this speaker rather than talking about the poet. Uh, if you're going to talk about the the mother of these two sons, all right. In the poem, there's an exploration of the the pain of. Uh, Uh, a son growing up. Uh, we've talked already about the Bildung's Roman and the idea of uh, moving through youthhood into um, adulthood. And essentially that's what's explored here by the poet as the speaker is a mum to a son who is first of all going on his first day of school or a day of school there's nothing actually to suggest that it was only the first day, but uh, it seems to be a, a monumental occasion. Uh, and then later on, the, the mum spends some time walking around a graveyard. And the implication is that this son has grown up, gone into the army, uh, and has been killed in action. So, um, in a, a graveyard like this, this is a a military graveyard. Uh, this one is in France. Um, but in the background of the Iran Afghanistan conflict, they might have been buried not in mass graves like this, but back home in the UK. So she spent some time walking around this churchyard where her son, who she remembers as a very young boy, uh, is now buried. Uh, there's a couple of images that appear in the poem that I think would, 
you might need a little bit of context for. This first one is a lint roller. You may have seen this, and this is the kind of thing that you would use to pick up if you've got, I don't know, little bits of hair, or cat hair, I think it is, that she talked about in this poem, uh, on your, your blazer there. Uh, your your mum might get a lint roller and rub your blazer to get rid of that kind of thing. Um, or on your coat there. So that's what this is, is a lint roller. In the poem, she doesn't have one of these, so she uses sellotape wrapped around her hand to do the same thing. Uh, the other image that is quite important is the dove. Obviously, we've got, got connotations of peace. And that flies around the graveyard. We'll come back to that one as well. But uh, it does seem to suggest that the poem is pacifistic in some way, or anti-war, if you like. And it is. It's a war poem. It was commissioned as a war poem. So do talk about war as much as possible when it comes to this one. Okay. So a couple of themes that appear. Uh, first of all, it's childhood and how fleeting it is, how long it, it lasts, not very long at all, into adulthood. Uh, and the idea of the power of motherhood in many ways. Uh, this mum is being forced to let their, their son go and be independent out in the world. Uh, and she finds it quite difficult and it's very emotional. Uh, she also spends a lot of time discussing memories of her son, uh, particularly when he was young. And then there's a bit of a jump until he is um, much, much older. Uh, I've got a chain here or a link to kind of symbolize the, the mother and son relationship, uh, the bond that they share and the distance and location can't modify that. Uh, she still feels very strongly connected to her son. So you can talk about the power of memory. Or love there, if you, if you like. Uh, and then connected to that idea of memory. This is a retrospective. Uh, time is quite important in this poem as the mum looks backwards okay, to when he was young and remembers. So it is about the power of memory and the power of uh, emotion to endure. You can say they're mean if you want to make that comparison. Okay, I've already popped down here that we'll do the blue for ideas. The red is going to be our language structure and form. And the green is our context, which we've already done. I'll do what I usually do. Seems to be working okay, which is I'll read through one time. I've broken it up into two uh, parts for annotation so that I can send you out the PowerPoint. But I'll read through one time first before we start annotating by line by line. Okay, and it, this is from the perspective, the point of view of a mother who has a son who is a soldier and who has been killed in action, which is implied. So it is from the perspective of this mum. All right. Three days before Armistice Sunday, and poppies had already been placed on individual war graves. Before you left, I pinned one onto your lapel. Crimped petals, spasms of red paper, disrupting a blockade of yellow bias binding around your blazer. Sellotape bandaged around my hand, I rounded up as many white cat hairs as I could, smoothed down your shirt's upturned collar, steeled the softening of my face. I wanted to graze my nose across the tip of your nose, play at being Eskimos like we did when you were little. I resisted the impulse to run my fingers through the gelled black thorns of your hair. All my words flattened, rolled, turned into felt, slowly melting. I was brave as I walked with you to the front door, threw it open, the world overflowing like a treasure chest. A split second and you were away, intoxicated. After you'd gone, I went into your bedroom, released the songbird from its cage. Later, a single dove flew from the pear tree, and this is where it has led me. Skirting the churchyard walls, my stomach busy making tucks, darts, pleats, 
hatless without a winter coat or reinforcement of scarf, gloves. On reaching the top of the hill, I traced the inscriptions on the war memorial, leaned against it like a wishbone. The dove pulled freely against the sky, an ornamental stitch. I listened, hoping to hear your playground voice catching on the wind. Okay, so just narration wise, from what's going on, I'll try and simplify it for you. So this is about a mother who is discussing her son who appears to be going off to school. And she discusses how painful that is. And there seems to be a comparison then to the fact that this person has gone off to war. And the mum has found it very difficult to let go. In both circumstances. Okay, number one, uh, to, to give the son independence. And then, secondly, uh, to grieve uh, when the son has died, unfortunately. Okay, so let's work through it line by line. Um, the, the ending of this poem, I think, is particularly poignant uh, when we talk about this, this voice catching on the wind. Uh, she seems to be listening out for her son, knowing that he can no longer speak to her. Okay. Three days before Armistice Sunday, so we know that in November, we have these ceremonies, uh, Remembrance Day. So this is Remembrance Sunday. That could be context, if you like, but very clearly, uh, time is established. So a November period, um, and this son is going off to school. Probably not his, fir his first day at school, but it seems to be that it's a it's a monumental occasion for the mum. She's re releasing him or letting him go. Or he could then say that potentially uh, this is the son going off to war. Maybe he is in his full military regalia, and he is heading off to his um, his tour. Three days before Armistice Sunday, and poppies had already been placed on individual war graves. Okay, individual. This adjective here used to describe the graves seems to uh, suggest that maybe a little bit of anger about the anonymity. We often hear things like uh, 1,000. 1,000 killed, 20,000 dead. Those kind of things appear to us always to be um, just statistics. We don't really consider the individuality of the person there, but all 1,000 of those people had mothers, had fathers, had brothers, sisters, and the impact for those people will be long lasting. And um, Before you left, I pinned one onto your lapel, right? So. What we can talk about here is the perspective. Because this is direct address, isn't it? She's speaking directly to her son. So the speaker, the mum, is speaking to her son at this point. I pinned one onto your lapel. That makes it nice and clear there. So the I is the personal pronoun. I pinned one onto your lapel. The verb to pin. And then a lapel here is a noun, I'll explain what that is. So if you come over here, have a little look. This bit here, that is a lapel. Okay, so usually people will put their poppy here, wouldn't they? Let's see if I can do that. Okay. Oh yeah, that's not so bad. So uh, this poppy has been pinned onto his lapel. Uh, she describes the crimped petals. Again, your adjective. If you've ever bought a poppy or if you wear one every year, you'll know that the poppies are made out of paper. And they're crimped, meaning that the, the paper kind of zigzags in and out like this. Like that. Uh, to make them look more like they're actual real flowers. Okay. Uh, spasms of red paper disrupting a blockade of yellow binding. By a bias binding, 
around your blazer. Okay, a couple of things. You can spot the alliteration straight away, can't you? Uh, with the, the blazer, the binding, and the bias uh, around your blazer. With the blockade. Blockade is a very uh, military word. So the use of military language here seems to be deliberate. A blockade in the military would be, I don't know if we've got some trucks here and they're trying to get by, we put up some barriers to say, no, you can't get through, no way, no pass, this is a blockade. Okay, so this binding, which is running all around the blazer, has been disrupted, uh, it's been blocked out by this flash of colour. So there's a contrast between the, the brightness of the poppy against the, the binding of the blazer. Binding, and this is where we bring in our textiles knowledge, so she's deliberately used this word. Uh, binding is this, this bit here that runs around the edge of the blazer. So you can kind of see it there. I'll rub it out in a second. All of that is binding. Uh, you, you see it usually on school uniforms, so particularly school uniforms, or maybe military blazers. Military uniforms as well sometimes happen around your blazer, okay? So this suggests that he's off to school. So he's being independent for the first time. All right, now this is a monumental occasion for any mum. So we can talk about the maternal instincts at play here. Any parent there, their son or daughter going off to the school for the first time is like a transition from child into young adult. She describes what she was doing. She had salatite bandaged around my hand and I rounded up as many white cat hairs as I could. So this is a very caring mother. What she's doing here is she is um, modifying his appearance. She presents him to the world. Uh, I don't know, you can take the idea, I suppose. We've all got mums who maybe uh, dip a tissue in their mouth and wipe whatever mess it is that's off your face or your cheek before you head off to school. So this is very maternal, very caring, very loving. And she removes the white cat hairs, okay? So this is a very domestic picture, isn't it? The family home with uh, the pet. And she's removing all of those hairs so that he can go off to school and look his best. She rounds up as many as she can. You can use the verb rounding if you want there. She's kind of like a, I don't know, it's like she's herding. Uh, and smooth down your shirt's upturned collar. So essentially what she's doing here, smooth, steel, rounded, all of these verbs. What she's doing is she is presenting her son, she's fixing his appearance uh, and she's doing so in a very loving way. I smooth down your shirt's upturned collar. So she's fixing him in many ways, uh, which is going to be in contrast to what she can do later on. She no longer has this opportunity. So these are very uh, tactile, personal uh, and mothering uh, verbs. So she fixes his collar. It's like he's a little boy, isn't it? Maybe a little rebellious there, if you like. He doesn't care that his his collar is upturned. He doesn't care how he looks. He just wants to have some fun. And she steals the softening of her face. So here, the verb steals to make stronger. And the reason she needs to make herself stronger is because she feels very emotional. It's likely that she's going to cry. So she has to stop herself. She says, no, I'm not going to cry. I'm going to make myself stronger so that I don't make a scene. 
uh, him off to school on his first day or off to military college or off to Iraq or Afghanistan, whatever it is that's happening here. I wanted to graze my nose across the tip of your nose, play at being Eskimos like we did when you were little. Okay, I won't say too much about the consistent, um, really I should have done that in red, uh, enjambment that's going on. But you can see that the, the sentence doesn't end uh, in the same line. So what we've got is a relatively consistent enjambment going on. I wanted to graze my nose across the tip of your nose, play at being Eskimos, like we did when you were little. What I'd be talking about here is the, the inclusivity of the pronoun. Uh, when you were little, the adjective here, which describes him as being small, which itself has connotations of needing to be protected uh, or being vulnerable. So he's very vulnerable. He's only a little boy. I wanted to graze my nose. The verb to graze. Uh, usually associate that with animals that may be uh, grazing on feed but here it just means to move back and forth uh, particularly over a field that would be and here's what she's talking about I wanted personal pronoun to graze my nose again across the tip of your nose and play it being Eskimos like we did when you were little so this image of uh, an Eskimo kiss is what this is and um, maybe you know what this is and uh, particularly people do with young kids so the idea that you would uh, rub noses together as a sign of uh, I don't know brotherhood sisterhood intimacy and uh, mother and son father and son father and daughter that kind of thing to graze your nose across the tip of your nose and play at being Eskimos this is a very um, it's a very endearing image, isn't it? It's childlike. And most importantly, I think it conveys the innocence, particularly of youth. So she wants him to return to being young, being safe, uh, being secure, not being adult. So she'd much prefer that he was back in those days. Uh, being nice and young and safe and protected. And she resists the impulse. I resisted the impulse, your verb there, to resist, to not, to stop herself. Resisted the impulse to run my fingers through the gelled black thorns of your hair. Right, so what's happening here is that the son has got himself some, uh, some hair gel here. And he's put it in his hair and because he's put it into his hair, he's got these spikes, these thorns. Uh, this is a blackberry brush here, and you can see all of those thorns. So the gelled black thorns, the idea is that they're sharp. Uh, she doesn't want to disrupt them, uh, but he's deliberately put this gel in his hair, maybe to make himself seem more grown up. Uh, from a from a child's perspective, that might be something that they do maybe on a special occasion. So she resists the urge to ruin his hair. She wants to she she desires contact. She wants to hug and cuddle and um, mess with his hair, but she's, she tries to stop herself. And she has an emotional reaction. This could be hyperbolic, if you like. She could be exaggerating here to a degree. But she says that all my words flattened, rolled, turned into felt. Uh, these verbs are really interesting. Flattened, rolled, turned into felt. So this is your way you bring in your textiles. Because we know that Jane Weir is interested in that kind of thing. So this is something that you would do um, when you're maybe designing um, a dress or a jacket or whatever it is. 
uh, all of her words have become ruined. So she becomes inarticulate in the face of this emotion. So she's not able to speak. Let me put that very simply for you. She is speechless. And she describes that using this image, okay? This is very metaphorical. All of her words become flattened, rolled, turned into felt. You can't flatten a word, you can't roll a word, but the idea is that they are losing their meaning. There's nothing she can say that would make it any better for her. Okay. Now, I particularly like this one. I had to split it into two here, but you can see the enjambment having a, a big effect here. So she was flattened, rolled, turned into felt, slowly melting. Uh, the use of the verb melting I think is particularly interesting because it's present tense. Oh. So slowly melting. So as a mum, she is overcome with emotion. Uh, it's interesting then that the present turns to the past. She says, I was brave as I walked with you to the front door, threw it open, the world overflowing like a treasure chest. And then she starts to use the past tense uh, quite frequently. So the tense seems to have shifted. We're in the past now, very clearly. We were in the present. What you can say about that shift is, uh, maybe this is the recognition of his death, or maybe this is the recognition of his growth. We're now talking about him as an adult, if you like. And she is being retrospective. She's looking back, this is somewhat of a remembrance herself from her perspective. I was brave as I walked with you to the front door. She's still talking to him directly, to you. It's your direct address to the front door. I threw it open. The verb to throw it open uh, means that she was, she was keen. She was willing, she was happy to throw the world open to him, uh, but this idea of throwing the, the, the door open is twofold here. So it's metaphorical because she literally, she's just opening the door. And if we want to do the metaphorical, uh, if it's a metaphorical door, she is uh, giving him opportunity. She is opening up the world to him. So there's a world of opportunity being opened up to this young boy as he goes out for the first time, or as this son moves out of home, or this son goes away uh, into the army. And the world is overflowing like a treasure chest. So this is your simile, which conveys a simile, a similar idea. Like a treasure chest, which suggests to us that he can do anything. He can afford to be ambitious, joyous, and he can really enjoy himself out there in the world. The world itself is a treasure chest. An interesting choice of image, I suppose. You can kind of talk about pirates there, if you like, because we, have, we often think about pirates as being something connotative with treasure chests, um, which in itself has got some sort of military. I suppose, if you like, it's a bit of a navy there if you really want. Um, I focus more about the, the power of opportunity um, that is in the world for this young boy to go and enjoy. And here she talks about uh, time passing again. She says, a split second and you were away, intoxicated. All right, two things we can say here. Well, any number of things. 
a split second. So you can talk about the siblings if you like. I would avoid that one. Much better I feel to talk about the uh, the speed. And this seems to be hyperbolic. Uh, a split second. So it, as soon as she opens the door, he's gone. Absolutely blisters out of the door there. Very, very fast. So either it feels that way to her that he's abandoning her or he actually has run very very quickly away uh, and the reason that she thinks he's run away is that he's intoxicated and uh, this is an adjective uh, it, you could say intoxicated it needs to be drunk on something um, you might, you might have connotations there with maybe drink or drugs or what have you, but you can be intoxicated on anything. This is a bit the chemicals in your brain. To be intoxicated, uh, here he's intoxicated. He is drunk on life, on opportunity. Uh, he can't wait to go away and explore essentially what is endless. So the, the possibilities are endless for him. She says, now a little bit of a shift in time. After you'd gone, I went into your bedroom. So he goes off to school or he goes off to uh, the military. And after you were gone, I went into your bedroom, which is going to be now vacant. It's going to be empty. And this is how she feels about it. She says, I released. A songbird from its cage so she feels like she has this is your metaphor she has released uh, a songbird from its cage so here the Sun is supposed to be the songbird now the idea being that something that makes music something that brings joy uh, should not be kept for selfish reasons in a cage Instead, it should be set free. And that's what she does. She sets him free to enjoy his own life. So when she sets that songbird free, she has granted her son independence. So he is now able to go and enjoy his own uh, life, his own choices thanks to the support of his mother. I went into your bedroom and released that songbird from its cage. She uses then another temporal connective here later. So time is going by again. Now this could be years, it could be days, months, whatever. A single dove flew from the pear tree. Uh, again, this seems to be metaphorical. You might associate the pear tree with this Christmas song a partridge in a pear tree. Dove we associate obviously with peace. Uh, so it's interesting that she puts the, the dove in the pear tree rather than the partridge. Um, there's lots you can say about that. I won't go too into it in too much detail but it seems to be that later a single dove flew from the pear tree and this is where it has led me. Um, we often release doves and maybe at the end of a, a wedding, maybe at the end of a funeral. To me, this line uh, is where we recognise that the, the son has died. So, this is where it has led me. Uh, she's now in a graveyard. So we've got a bit of a shift in... Um, Space and time, shall we say? I don't want to overcomplicate it there. I already said something very complicated. Um, so we are no longer in the house. We've gone from the house to the graveyard. Oh, that was a shame. So we've gone from the house to the graveyard. This is where it has led me. You want to be fancy. Uh, skirting the graveyard walls, 
my stomach busy making tucks, darts, pleats. Uh, what you want to talk about here is she's now in the graveyard and she's skirting. We're back to the present tense now. Uh, the verb to skirt means to either move around the edges, so she's moving around the edges of the graveyard like that, or um, we could talk a little bit about the jargon phrase there, to, to skirt, it can mean to uh, sew around the edge of something, so if I was to get my blazer back here, uh, you might put a stitch along the edges like that, that can be skirting as well. I believe, no expert there, but I'm having a crack. Uh, my stomach was busy making tucks and darts and pleats. Uh, the triple of these verbs. Uh, to tuck, to dart, to pleat. Uh, in this context, however, I will probably argue more that they are simple nouns because they are jargon words which describe um, types of sewing or uh, textile skills. So, um, I don't know, a school's skirt is an easy one to think of. So if you've got your skirt there, you know that it's got like these little bits at the bottom of it there. Uh, they are kind of sewn together, that they, they overlap. It's kind of like a zigzag like that, isn't it? So that this piece of material comes down and covers those. Those are, I think they're called pleats. Uh, you might have heard of a pleated skirt, for example. Um, but all of our tuck, that's when a piece of material is folded under another piece of material. A dart, I'm gonna confess, I've got no idea. Um, but I assume it's very similar to this, where material is folded and then sewn in a particular way to have a, a function when it falls a particular way. So with tucks and darts and pleats, uh, she's still making all of these moves. To me, uh, what you want to be thinking about here is she's moving around the graveyard, okay? Here's the, the church, maybe that's the steeple, and there's lots of graves. And to me, what's happening is, try to think of her having like a, a Pac-Man thing going on. She's moving all of the time, and she's walking around the edge of the, uh, the churchyard, and then she's making all sorts of top and darts and pleats uh, so maybe think of Pac-Man in there if that's useful for you so she's moving all of the time to me that says that she doesn't really know what she's doing she doesn't know where to go she's lost yeah, and that's grief that's done that to her if you ask me uh, without a winter coat or reinforcements or scarves and gloves so this here is the uh, the physical pain to go along with the emotional. She's got no scarf, she's got no gloves, so she feels very cold. Uh, cold in two ways. She feels emotionally cold because she's lost her son. She feels physically cold because it's a freezing cold day. Uh, maybe still in November. She doesn't have reinforcements. I think it's really interesting that she uses that word reinforcements because it's got military connotations. We might call for backup or the cavalry. She doesn't have any reinforcements because she's lost her son. There is nothing that can replace that for her. She can call on no reinforcements. On reaching the top of the hill, so we've got our preposition here to ground us. We know that something else is happening now. Time has passed again. This is present tense again. It's what you call a Quran verb. I'm reaching the top of the hill. I trace the inscriptions on the war memorial. Okay. This verb to trace here is really interesting because you can actually get a piece of paper, put it over against um, a, a gravestone here that has some inscription. Maybe you could rub on to that a crayon and through that paper then you might find that the stone engraving would be then on your piece of paper so tracing here can be two things it's a verb 
could mean to copy here. So she traces the inscriptions or she could mean just she's reading them. So she traces the inscriptions on the war memorial and leans against it like a wishbone. So what's happening here is she is leaning against the drawing. You see these kind of war memorials. Uh, and it's going to have like a little, I don't know, a little devotion at the bottom here. So um, it's going to have all sorts of poppies around it here. Uh, and she's spending some time reading the inscription that is at the bottom of this war memorial. Uh, and she leans against it. So the inscriptions, these are the names of the dead. Uh, amongst them, probably her son on the war memorial. And she leans against it like a wishbone. Uh, lean there, the verb. We've got some connotations there. She needs support. So it physically supports her, lifts her up, holds her up. Uh, you've got the, the simile, like like a wishbone and then a little, little bit of context for you so a wishbone then you've got this wishbone you may find in um, poultry where you've got these bones that are kind of constructed like this and what happens is one person takes this side another person takes this side and then pull them apart and whoever has the, the biggest side wins um, Kind of like a cracker and um, so like a wishbone here to me uh, she is wishful she wants her son back and she would do anything to get it so to me the monument is there like this this is one part of the wishbone so this is a monument set and then on the other side of the monument we've got our our mum who is taking a minute and she's leaning against it and um, you could talk about her exhaustion here she's exhausted she's emotionally exhausted so she needs to take some time to lean against the the um, inscriptions on the war memorial this piece of stone this massive piece of granite here that's been erected in the memorial um, so she says she leans against the wishbone and then she notices this can be metaphorical or it could be literal, difficult to say, but a dove pulls freely, a dove pulls freely against the sky. So if we think about this adverb and we go back to that image earlier on about being set free, a bird that is set free, this dove is now free, this other dove. Or it could be the same if, we, if, if you like. A dove pulls freely against the sky. So we know we associate doves with peace. And a dove has flown through the sky. So she sees a dove. Like that. And it's flying away. And this dove is carefree. Uh, like she wishes her son was. Uh, we could be saying here that life goes on. Something piety like that, if you like. But what interests me is the, the simile she uses where she says uh, the dove was an ornamental stitch, which is a metaphor. It can't literally be an ornamental stitch. Here's an example of an ornamental stitch. I picked this one because I think it, it probably reflects the metaphor best. So if this is my dove, And you can see it's kind of got the shape of a bird in many ways. It's not perfect, but the idea of ornamental stitches. An ornamental stitch is only for decoration. So the suggestion is that this dove maybe is decorative only. It has no meaning. And if it represents peace, maybe there is some sort of anti-war sentiment there 
where she's saying that we, we can release as many doves into the sky as we want, but we're only paying lip service. Up to you. Uh, so the doll pulls against the sky, leaving an ornamental stitch like pattern being left behind. The idea of this bird here. Oh, that's awful. And that's how you draw a bird when you're a kid, isn't it? And a painting, you kind of just go like that, cut them off in the distance. Uh, and she listened. Again, we're back to the past tense. So she listened, hoping, and this is present tense, hoping to hear your playfine voice catching on the wind. So again, direct address to the sun. And it's almost like she pleads. She wants more contact with her son. She's grieving and mourning. Uh, and you could, if you want, talk a little bit about the uh, the stages of grief. Uh, one of which, particularly, is oh. They might want to talk about is denial. The other one that's important here is bargaining. And finally comes acceptance. I should really have done these green because they're more context to be honest. But the stages of grief. First you deny it. You go, no, no, he can't be dead. There's no way he's dead. Then we, we tend to bargain. I'd give anything to have him back. And that's kind of where she is here. I'm hoping to hear your play when the voice catch on the wind. Uh, maybe a little bit of denial there and then finally we come to acceptance so she's not quite at that point of acceptance yet so this is a mother who is mourning and essentially the power comes from her grief uh, her loving feelings towards her son uh, potentially the power of memory here we want to talk about conflict you can talk about her being in conflict with herself. She's unable to believe that this is a possibility. You could talk about the very literal impact of war uh, and loss. And then I suppose you could talk about um, the conflict with oh, time. She's fighting time continually, isn't she? She wants to go back to the way things used to be. Okay. Hope you find that one useful. Some bad art in that one, particularly like Pac-Man here working his way around the, the graveyard. That seems fairly tasteless, but hopefully you'll find it effective. Um, and I'll throw up the next one very shortly. Okay, thanks for joining me, guys. See you later.